Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pietro Paganini, and I'm speaking from the center of Italy right now. And today we are launching the second live stream of our beautiful uh, free market roadshow uh, uh, seminars. Um, since we were supposed to be in Rome in June, and obviously the event is going to be postponed hopefully in September, we decided not to postpone everything, but to anticipate with you know, the advantage of using technology. And today we are exactly on Zoom. Uh, for the second time, we started last week with a beautiful discussion over uh, Europe in the time of the, uh, the, the virus invasion. And today we continue. So we can say, and as I like to say, that there is no virus, there is no epidemic, there is no pandemic that can stop us. And in fact, here we are. And today we are with a topic that, uh, you know, some, some of our audience, some of our friends around Europe have been, have been working on for the, past, uh, for the past weeks particularly, because in, in a way it might be a big threat to our individual, uh, individual freedom. So we go today with three beautiful speakers, great experts in the field of freedom and in the field of privacy and data protection. I would like to start from the, the other side of the ocean, therefore in the United States, particularly in Michigan, where we have Georgina Constantin Parque, then moving back to Europe, where we have in Italy, uh, uh, Luca Bolognini, and then up to the north of Europe in Sweden, in Malmö, exactly where we have Anders uh, Istedt. So I will like to start with Georgina, um, because you are in the US, because it's early morning, so I want you to wake up and energize our, <laughs> our debate that I'd like to uh, remember, it, remind you guys, it's also live on YouTube, and as usual, as last week, it will be recorded, and it will be available forever online and our goal here is not just to discuss but is also to disseminate so please whenever you have a chance and time take the video post it share it make sure that as many people as possible can watch it the purpose here is just to get together in a time where we cannot get together eventually in rome in in in, in june but is also to strengthen our network even if we are at home and it's of course to discuss but also to disseminate the knowledge that we are going to produce it's also a chance to talk to great experts. So the, uh, the, the aim of today is not just to listen to these three great people, but is also to ask questions and eventually to make comments. As you know, the chat line and the question and answer line is open. As last week, I'll try to read all the questions, but since there are many or there were many last week, I couldn't, so don't be mad at me. I'll try to read as much as possible and pass the ball. So the three speakers are well instructed that they should stay in the web or webinar timing that is not 30 minutes or three hour speech, but it's a five minute, six minute speech, and then have a, a quick round table and then leave the, floor, the, 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 the word to the floor. So let me go to the United States early morning where we have Georgina. So the advent, also in the US right now, unlike what President Trump said a few weeks ago, the virus is changing a lot of things, you know, we all know about that, but the advent of the COVID-19 is might represent a threat to our freedoms, not just in terms that we have to stay home and we cannot walk outside and there's strong and strict rules, but also because there is a discussion that it might affect some of the rules that protect our data on one side, but also what we care very much being our uh, privacy. So Georgina, tell us, and I like to remember that Georgina is a PhD in uh, political science from the University of Bucharest. And she studied in Bucharest. She's originally from Romania, but she has moved to the United, uh, United States, although she flies back and forward, or she was used to do that. And she teaches at the Liberty uh, University online program. Georgina, what is your view? Is our privacy for the coming weeks and months at risk? I have to say that even over here in the United States, I've noticed a lot of things, um, especially when it comes to changing the rules here in Michigan, we are now in a state of disaster. So from the beginning of, of this whole crazy uh, COVID-19 pandemic, people have been taking it slower and slower and slower, and then faster and faster and faster. Finally, President Trump and, and all of these, um, the people in the government over here are trying to really take control and they're trying to, to, to keep control, but um, we don't know, for instance, if we look back in, in Europe, uh, what Viktor Orban did, uh, where he, uh, he had a power grab in the middle of this crisis, a lot of people are afraid of that. 
Um, so, you know, one, one of the things that I've noticed happening when I first arrived to the United States, in the United States, was that a lot of people were having conversations about freedom. These conversations were very lively. They were always on television. People were always very much aware of what their freedoms were doing um, and, and if their freedoms were in, in trouble or not. And this wasn't something that I was used to from Romania. So um, our conversations were not very lively. We had just come out of communism. We weren't very much aware of how to do this democracy thing. Um, but the one thing that I noticed that shocked me was that I, when I came to the United States, the, the consequences of this freedom of speech, for instance, were a lot more difficult to take. They were career ending consequences for some people to say their mind, to speak their mind, to say the wrong thing. Whereas, so you had a lively conversation about your freedom, but you also had these horrible consequences where you might get fired for saying the wrong thing or calling somebody the wrong thing. And back in Romania, we didn't have these lively conversations about our freedoms yet, but you were free to say a lot of things because people probably just didn't care. They didn't really know how, how this whole thing went. So I'm, I'm over here now in a, in a place where I can look at Europe and look at the United States and say that our freedoms are actually in, in trouble everywhere. In Romania, my people back home, they can't really get out of the house without having this little paperwork to prove that they have a good reason for going out. And I've heard the craziest stories about somebody needing to go to the pharmacy to get their asthma inhalers and somebody giving them a fine for that because they either didn't believe them or they were abusing their powers. So it's scary. It's a scary time, absolutely. Um, and I think that we have to be we have to be vigilant. You know, that, that old saying that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, it's been attributed to a lot of people over history, but it stands true. Whoever it was that said it first, this stands absolutely true to this day. We have to have a conversation. We have to be aware of what's happening. My computer is reminding me that I'm mute. I have Siri <laughs> telling me, hey, man, you're mute. Thank you, Siri, for doing that. Please report back to Apple and to the US government that I'm mute. Um, uh, Thank you. We see that you're also cold inside the house, so hopefully you're inside and not outside. Uh, let, me, let me move to, to Rome and, and precisely to, to Luca Bolognini. Luca Bolognini is a lawyer. Uh, he's a lawyer specialized in, in information and communication technology and specifically in privacy. So probably he's one of the best person in, for today's uh, today conversation. And uh, he's uh, also the founder of the Italian Institute for Privacy, probably the first uh, independent organization in the early 2000s that focused on the topic of privacy in Europe and the topic of the data protection. And uh, I have also to say that I, I'm sorry, I'm very Americanized, so I say privacy, Luca, people tend to say privacy in Europe or in the UK, uh, although they are out of Europe, so let me say privacy with some, uh, with some pride. So Luca, do you see a threat to individual freedom with relation to the COVID-19? Yes, I, I see it, uh, and uh, thank you, thank you for uh, uh, inviting my, me uh, here uh, with you. But uh, yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, I see some threats, uh, and I'm uh, pretty worried because it is clear that uh, on one end we have to protect life and health of people, uh, but it is also clear that uh, governments around the world are, are using this emergency in order to activate new tools so that are tools that can uh, somehow uh, limit uh, or at least hinder our liberty our freedom and also our uh, fundamental rights uh, that are instrumental rights uh, for freedom for dignity for many other uh, fundamental values uh, of human beings so uh, yes we have to fear and to fight against uh, the virus, of course. Uh, I can understand, and I commented uh, uh, several times during these last days, uh, also the projects uh, of the Italian government, uh, uh, I can understand uh, the need of uh, contact tracing uh, tools, uh, solutions in order to uh, fence the, 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 the virus, uh, but uh, what is key now is not to allow governments to adopt something that will limit our liberty in the future, after the emergency, or leveraging on the fact that uh, the emergency will uh, never pass, we will never get through 
this uh, emergency. There will be always there will always be a, a good reason in order to in order to uh, continue tracking, tracing, tailing uh, people. So uh, the values and the rights and freedoms at stake are uh, several values. We know that we have life, we have health, but we have privacy, we have data protection, we have uh, people's freedom, and we have to balance them together. Uh, what I think is that, uh, and I'm seeing this uh, happening, uh, is that uh, uh, with the justification of the emergency, uh, several governments and legislators are now saying, let us run. We have to approve these new solutions to track people. There is no time. Uh, we cannot lose time uh, uh, approving uh, constitutional legislation, approving uh, specific decrees, uh, uh, laws, I mean, uh, in order to allow and to regulate uh, also for the future these uh, systems. No, we have to run. We have to adopt this uh, to start tracking, tracking. And this is a big mistake, in my opinion, just to share with you this uh, critical point. This is a, a big mistake because this is the time during the emergency running, of course running, but this is the right time to uh, adopt and to approve new laws, even amendments to constitutions, in order to ensure that there, are, there will be uh, all the safeguards in order to uh, limit the usage of these, uh, of these tracking tools. And uh, when, they, when I say safeguards, I'm thinking about, and then I stop, uh, I'm thinking about the possibility, for instance, for data protection authorities in Europe, at least in Europe we have independent authorities, the possibility for them to, uh, to, to direct appeal uh, before the uh, constitutional courts or the court of justice of the European Union in order to uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to, to claim and to uh, lodge a, com a, a complaint uh, in, in order to demonstrate that a new law that was an emergency law, emergency law is not valid, no more at least, because the emergency is, is no more there. This is an example. So we are risking a lot. It is right, we have to run, we have to fight, against the virus, but we have also now running, not later, uh, we have to approve safeguards at the level of laws and constitutional laws. Thank you, Luca, for this uh, strong uh, defense of, uh, of uh, freedom. Obviously, as Georgina mentioned earlier, this is a strong also defense. You know, it, it can put you in a very uh, unpopular position, particularly right now, because people say health, we got to solve the problem. So you, you uh, underline this very, very well. But we're coming back to that later. Let me, uh, let me move to, to Sweden, uh, uh, surely to Anders. Anders uh, Istedt is an advisor at the Scantech Strategy, advisor to major Swedish industry and the business organization. He's also an entrepreneur, author, and chairman of the Svensk Tindiskrift, a weekly journal of politics, economics, and culture founded in the early uh, 900. Uh, uh, Hista has previously uh, written books about taxation, the importance of 1911. Huh? 1911, yes. They, very Swedish. Uh, I was very Italian being general. You've been very Swedish. No, it's 1911. Uh, ownership and also ITEX. Uh, uh, Sweden abolished the uh, inheritance tax in 2015, and now Sweden got rid of the wealth tax in 2000. And 18. So the ball comes to uh, Malmo. Uh, Anders? Thank you very much. Uh, happy to join you here today. And I hope there is, uh, I have a little sl slow connection. I think there is, we have problems, general problems in Sweden due to the crisis. A lot of people are doing video meetings and so on. But I hope if it goes down, you have to continue with someone else. But we try like this. So you, thanks for the presentation. The Svensk Tidskrift is a liberal conservative magazine. So it's a lot of uh, libertarians reading it. And so, so let me give you a Corona update from Sweden. 
we are a little bit later than uh, Italy and uh, as for now it's like 280 deaths in Sweden and there has been a lot of reports on, on how Sweden tackled this crisis and we have a little, little bit less regulation than, than some other countries. And uh, I try to see if I can share uh, the screen with, with uh, a picture from you. Let's see if it works. Can you see this? So we see, a, yeah, ah, now we see a that, picture. It takes some time. Try again. <laughs> okay, uh, try again. Uh, this is a bag with a quote from our Prime Minister Stefan Löfven. It says, it's not okay. That's a typical quote from him. He's very difficult to understand and it's not, no, it's not very good actually. But uh, in, in this crisis, he had to speak to the, to the nation last week and he was saying something that was quite, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I'll share another picture. Does this work? Can you see this? This is, uh, he was tape making a speak to, to, uh, to, uh, to the nation and uh, asked about why do we not do more strict measures. He said, we can't legislate on everything. Now it's a matter of good manners. And my good friend, Johan Norberg said, is there one time in life he could be social democrat as Stefan Löfven is when he heard the prime minister saying this. this he, he actually trusts that uh, people should have good manners instead of more regulation. I think that's a good way to Hey, Anders, we lost you for a moment. Think you lost, Anders, you, you hear me? Good. I think we lost Anders for a moment. Oh, here you're back. I think I moved to see if I get a better connection somewhere else. You follow you're me around my house. You are destroying, you're destroying my Swedish dream, Anders. Huh? I always thought about Sweden as the best broadband in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> usually. <laughs> I actually have 1,000 megabits. Uh, yes, indeed, I know. But uh, I, I thought that was Romania. <laughs> so, Soon. so did you see the did, did you all see the picture of the prime minister with a yes. quote yes yeah so going on from from uh, from uh, from that uh, i think the corona that appears as a health crisis but we go on to financial crisis and perhaps later on also an, an integrity crisis and i live as close as possible to the to the border to denmark and we have, uh, and the border is closed, and that's a very high threat to our to our personal freedom, of course. But we also will probably see a lot of uh, regulation that that that, uh, that uh, yeah make our freedom less. And um, let's hope that that will uh, will be will be not a big problem but I think it's it's really is and uh, but I also think that a lot of regulation in Sweden in, in Europe and the European Union is actually not so much for uh, privacy issues I think it's more like a business problem also and especially against American business I think for instance legislation against social media as Facebook or or uh, against Google which is actually more uh, sort of politicians afraid of competition from from uh, from the U.S. and I think actually people could choose from them for themselves if they want to use social media platforms like Facebook or what kind of search engine to use for for themselves and then the market could regulate 
how much uh, about privacy and using these kind of social media platforms and so on. And uh, if, if people don't like uh, Facebook or Google or other American companies, they can choose other platforms. But I think a lot of people actually make these uh, decisions on the, on the in one side, they see it's practical and it's, it's useful. On the other side, of course, it's a, it's a threat to privacy, but people choose easy to use and, and a good business opportunity. So I think the European Union's regulation on, on, on this kind of uh, on privacy on, on social media is uh, more a threat to, to, to business and, uh, and a good business climate in Europe. And I would raise a question, perhaps to Luca, perhaps mostly. I think this GDPR is a sort of a, is a big threat to to perhaps aimed as a privacy measure, but I think it's a threat to business in Europe. It's a high cost for for business to cope with this kind of regulation. And I, my guess is actually some sort of misguided, misled, uh, ordo liberal measure, actually, and. Uh, I think could we perhaps talk just one minute of GDPR later on? So, so, but but for most people, uh, the the idea about the question about personal integrity and, and what's practical usable is is probably most people use what's practical usable, and uh, so as long as companies doesn't harm harm people, they will, and if they harm people, they will eventually be be hit by the market. Uh, my last example about the, the balance between integrity and what's practical usable is, is the use of cash. As, as uh, Pietro perhaps know from staying in Sweden, most Swedes doesn't have any cash at all. I never have Swedish cash. I have perhaps some euros or dollars with me, but never cash. We use uh, my phone or use cash at all because it's easy but of course it's also intellectual i understand that that is uh, uh it's possible to follow all my moves all where I, what how i live and, and where i buy my things and so on and that's of course integrity problem of course uh, i favor cash as an id and especially of course in in times when the interest rates will go perhaps below zero Okay, we lost Anders again. Uh, Anders, apologize if uh, I passed the ball. I, I go back to, to Michigan because Luca uh, mentioned something. Is I was very surprised and happy that in Rome he was uh, standing up for uh, uh, for freedom and defending the right to uh, the right to privacy. Do you see this risk also in the United States, where of course there is a very different interpretation of privacy uh, from the one we have in uh, uh, in Europe. Is there is this risk already there? Is it coming with new regulation or new attempt by government or tech giants to, let's say, start monitoring? Because Lucas said something important. Here we have on one side the health and, you know, the fact that we need to save lives and we are in a rush. And also the rush means, you know, saving the economy, basically. But we also see uh, that this is uh, uh, colliding and colliding with uh, individual freedom and privacy? Yeah, I have to say that living here in the United States right now where I am, you don't really feel as restricted as I'm hearing people in Europe are feeling. But I am reading all of these things that have to do with big companies such as Facebook and Google just wanting to kind of keep track on people. And um, the reason for that is they want to tell you the level of risk that you would be at if you'd be going into certain places and other things such as that. So they're really tracking your movement, which they've been doing forever, really. Um, but now it's, you know, th there's an extra reason for them to do that. So while it might not be as obvious with your restriction of movement as it is in Europe and other places, you can definitely feel that this is happening maybe somewhere behind the scenes. The conversation over here really is how to beat this and how do we, how do we just, um, how are we able to not overload the hospital system and stuff like that. But we have to remember that the U.S. Um, is a good example of how, um, uh, the desire to keep away um, certain problems, um, which will take away your, your uh, personal freedoms of, of movement and other things such as that temporarily, would lead to permanent scars in the fabric of freedom, such as the Patriot Act. So things that are left there, and then 
they're there and nobody actually goes back and deals with that to a certain degree. And, and um, you start from something horrible that happened. Obviously, 9-11 was a horrible tragedy and people needed to feel safe and they needed to feel secure. They wanted the state to do something and act on their behalf, but then they were left with this, this permanent black mark on their freedom. And this is something that can happen everywhere. Obviously, if it's happened in the United States with its wonderful checks and balances and, and, and its beautiful constitutional um, um, rights that it can happen everywhere and we're already seeing a lot of things like this in Europe. So really to answer your question, I guess more briefly is while you can't see these things, they are happening. If you if you if you know where to search, they're already happening. But the, the conversation among people right now is a little bit more relaxed than it is in Europe. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, Luke, I'm coming back to you uh, with a few questions that are being are being here delivered to me. Um, and I see Anders is back. Welcome back, Anders. Uh, of course, Anders was also provoking you, Luca. You are, but you know, Anders, Luca is a lawyer, first of all. So he's just happy that there are some very <laughs> tough regulation and strict regulation. That means much more work for him. That's business. That, that's free market. Um, anyway, Luca, beside the provocation on GDPR, and we can come to that uh, uh, in, in a while if you, if you, if you want. Uh, one of the questions is about the reaction of people are because of the emergency, don't you fear that people are going to turn, you know, against their own privacy because they see the emergency and they see the, 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 the fear. And second, you mentioned something important. We have to act to defend our, our, our privacy and our right to privacy. But where is the balance between the right to health, to save the country, save the economy, and individual privacy on the other side. Yes, I think that there is a, a huge challenge also for uh, governments, for legislators, as I mentioned before, uh, because we have many different fundamental rights and freedoms uh, at stake uh, and the balance uh, uh, requires uh, courage, requires uh, uh, vision and uh, yes uh, we are all used to to see uh, congressmen and congresswomen uh, uh, running approving uh, measures for economy uh, during emergency or uh, governments uh, uh, running approving decrees uh, and decisions in order to protect uh, health uh, people health people's health uh, but we should demand, should insist on the fact that uh, also uh, specific uh, safeguards for our uh, other rights, and privacy among them, uh, can be better protected even more during emergency. This is why, uh, this is because uh, we have a, 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 a challenge between uh, not absolute rights and not absolute freedoms. So we, we should uh, be able to dose and to use uh, the, the right measures in order to put together, to balance together all these uh, elements. To match is bad. To match uh, control is bad. And I'm uh, more uh, worried, uh, if I may, uh, when I think about the possible invasion of uh, citizens' privacy uh, coming from the public power, public uh, institutions, much more than the, uh, the, the possibility that uh, uh, big providers, uh, web, uh, internet providers, uh, uh, can uh, uh, monitor our lives uh, and profile ourselves. Yes, we all know that this happens uh, every day but what is happening now during the emergency is that public powers public institutions are trying to approve new systems and probably they have two in order to limit and to uh, fight against the, the virus but they are approving new systems new contact tracing tools that are designed in order to collect a lot of data coming from the private operators. So there is a sharing of data and the collection of data 
towards governments and public institutions coming from uh, social networks, uh, uh, online operators, uh, telco operators, uh, etc. Then uh, what, uh, what uh, will uh, happen is that uh, uh, the governments will uh, gather uh, huge amounts of information about ourselves. And what about this information, this processing of data, once the emergency will be, uh, will be passed? This is my, uh, my first anxiety, I, I must say, and the first objective of my, uh, of my uh, attention. And uh, I, I have also to say something about the GDPR. I, I, I agree uh, with, uh, uh, with some uh, uh, criticism uh, on uh, GDPR. GDPR is strong, even too strong, and let me say even too vague because it is full of uncertainty, of uh, law, uh, but it is very strong against uh, uh, private controllers, uh, undertakings, uh, 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 SMEs, uh, companies in general, and the risk uh, is to be fined uh, for huge amounts. While it seems to be so weak for governments, if you take the GDPR, you have so, so many uh, articles and paragraphs uh, leaving room to governments to do everything, almost everything, without respecting uh, even general principles of the GDPR for essential public interest uh, uh, purposes. And this is, uh, this is the reality. So we have uh, GDPR uh, hindering uh, somehow innovation and uh, market and the, the business on one end and giving room, margin of maneuver uh, to governments to do uh, many, many, many things, uh, again, without uh, uh, the, the needed safeguards probably. It depends on the national legislation, but it is not set at the European level, the, uh, the level of... Uh, uh, of safeguards for citizens, for, for data subjects in general. So uh, let us talk about these topics because they are relevant. Privacy is relevant. And now that we are all uh, at home using digital tools, uh, all uh, smart working remotely, then we are transformed more and more in data. In, uh, we are digitized more and more. And more and more, the privacy and data protection should be relevant. Also in the relationship and regulating the relationship between the private citizen, private user, and the public institution. Thank you, Luca. Anders, in this also taking one of the questions that came from FND that I suppose is Frederick as a name. Um, any, any, uh, anything to add to Luca? Also considering two facts, one is, happening here in Italy, for sure in Spain, probably in France, because some of these emergency or urgent uh, measures are being taken. Luca, before he corrected himself, he used the word uh, decree or directive uh, and not the law. Then you say law. But here the government is taking decisions actually without even consulting the parliament. Do you see this risk as a, as a, a, a strong risk? And second, um, here there is always a fight between the one of some liberals saying, well, I have nothing to hide, so my data can be there. And the fact that instead, what Luca exactly said, we need in a way to, you know, to regulate in order to ensure the citizen's right to protect his own, uh, his own privacy. First of all, I agree with Luca. I see the government as, uh, another, as a bigger threat than companies. Companies are, are no threat. They, if people can choose on the free market between companies, they, they can choose to be, have their privacy or not. So, but I see what the legislation could be a threat. And uh, looking at the situa current situation, I think a lot of people accept uh, quite harsh measures against uh, privacy or, or freedom of movement and so on during a crisis. But the, the worst thing is, is 
is that we keep that kind of, of uh, acceptance to the big government or big state and, and uh, if there will be remain something after this crisis. That's, that's, that's the thing that, that frightens me and that, that's important for people like us that fight for freedoms to, to look for that, that uh, as soon as possible we can go back to, to normal, normal uh, yeah. how, how to work every day, how it was before. Thanks, Anders. Um, before coming to Georgina and get to the end, uh, Luca, there's a, there's a question specifically for you. Do, you. do you see that there is too much power now in the hands of the executive? Uh, the same question in a way I made to Anders, that you know, governments are, you know, because it's, we are in a rush, they are taking too many decisions. And as you said, some of these decisions are very superficial and they can pave the way to you know, a, a new order in terms of new rules that actually undermine our privacy. And second question that goes to Georgina for an end, and then Anders, if you want to add, uh, before really closing our discussion. There is, and we see this, and now guys, let's not get offended here, but we see that when we talk about privacy, the level of participation goes down. Don't, don't be offended, it's a matter of fact. Uh, how do we instead educate people to uh, to figuring out that instead privacy and you know the control over their data and information is probably today the most valuable among the rights and freedoms that they have this is a it's a big question because i see my my kid i see probably lucas your kids and i'm not sure you guys have kids too but how they are dealing with information technology and they are you know throwing literally tons of data over there and at school or in any school private or public you know in you know in their daily life they don't have any concern or any discussion around privacy how do we get around that uh, if i if i may uh, i think that uh, uh, governments uh, now uh, have a a, a, a big opportunity, a great chance to uh, to, to limit uh, freedom uh, in an acceptable way, acceptable because the, the, the people can accept these new measures because there is the crisis, there is the emergency. And the, uh, the, the great opportunity is to make it not only acceptable now, but to create a new habit so that uh, uh, the new rules, so the emergency rules, can become the rules, uh, the ordinary rules of the future, of our behavior. And I think that this can be even more true if we talk about uh, immaterial dimensions and so also about privacy and data protection. Because uh, if you have a lockdown, you cannot work, uh, you cannot go outside your home, uh, probably you, you feel it, it, it will never, I, I would say it will never uh, become a, a habit, a real habit, uh, something really acceptable uh, for people. While other aspects uh, are silent and, and uh, difficult to even to perceive, them if government if a government will continue to track you after the, the emergency this will happen in silence you will not perceive this uh, uh, extraordinary you will not uh, take care so uh, this is why i am worried and i'm talking about the uh, necessity of uh, uh, new uh, constitutional safeguards now during the emergency for uh, just a few words uh, uh, on the uh, the children and the uh, education i i, uh, I think about uh, data uh, just like i think about virus uh, so i think it is a matter of uh, uh, hygiene education you don't know whether there is the virus on your hands, but you are uh, used and educated to wash your hands and to uh, 
and I, I read the, in, in the chat uh, good manners, yes, to, to respect uh, a way of living that is somehow hygienic. The same with data that are invisible like viruses. The, the same with data, with data protection, we should uh, educate this way our children and ourselves uh, uh, more than talking about uh, technicalities because if you if you teach technicalities you are not educating uh, children thank you siri for reminding that to me georgina can education you know what kind of education do you envision here you know, this is a this is an important question, and it's something I was I was also thinking about because if, if children and even my generation we don't really understand the direct consequences of having your data uh, being taken by other people and used maybe against you in certain ways. So it's not. It, it, I think the education needs to be pretty visual in terms of children, for example. If you just tell them about the problems that they might have because they didn't take five extra minutes to make sure that their data was insured they're not going to have the time for that. And I think um, probably, you know, starting with, um, first of all, I think the responsibility comes down to the family. We can't depend on the state to educate our children when it comes to stuff like that, even though it would be a great idea to have all of these things uh, be publicly talked about. I think that the most important part is just like manners that has been said over here time and time again, which is such a beautiful thing. It's up to manners. It's individual responsibility. It's the responsibility of the family to make sure children understand this. And before they can do that, the family needs to understand this as well. I find myself making a lot of mistakes online all the time because I don't understand exactly how I'm supposed to balance a lot of this, this privacy uh, data things. And oh, have you noticed when you have to choose the cookies, it takes five or 10 or God knows how many minutes to actually do those settings. It is just crazy. Somebody needs to do something about that particular one. But um, when it comes to making this visual for children, I think it, it's a good place to start perhaps with some literature. Maybe have them read 1984 or Brave New World or other things like that and then move into history. Um, because if they read these important things that have to do with privacy, have to do with the loss of liberty, then they might think, well, okay, that, that's fiction. And then that's when you introduce history and you say, ah, but it's not. Let me tell you the story of the communist regime in Russia. Let me tell you what happened to people in Romania. Wait, let me tell you what's happening with the, socialist credit, with the social credit system in China. Let me explain how we are a lot worse right now than how we were years ago when people had to physically be out of their house to track you. I mean, Facebook and all of these apps are any spy agency's dream. They don't need to look for you. You tell them where you are. And, you know, we see a lot of these, these things happen where people will post where they are and then somebody would text them or you would see this announcement somewhere on Facebook, do not tell people where you are when you're there because somebody might come and rob you. I mean, even thieves are learning how to use the technology at this point. So you have to be really, really careful and responsible how you do that. But when it comes to, to your children, I think you have to make it very visual and tell them that it's not impossible for this to happen. Just like something else is not impossible to happen. I was talking in one of my recent articles, uh, the phenomenon of scapegoating that's happening right now. A lot of people are blaming other people and try, instead of trying to find solutions. And if you look at this, this crazy type of thing that is happening, you know, you look at it and you think, well, that's okay. That's not going to cause a big deal. But that's really how a lot of the problems in history, genocides, and Lord knows what else, have started in the past. So while you don't want to restrict the freedom of speech, you do want to emphasize, just as we have here, manners and personal individual responsibility for that. Thank you, Georgina. I wanted to end with you, but I, I owe Anders, uh, because of the, of the short of uh, internet, I give you, Anders, the conclusion on that. There was no specific question, but you, is there anything you want to add? But please don't say you agree because one of the spirit of the seminars is to disagree. But here I heard too much. We agree. So on what Sorry. do you disagree? <laughs> Sorry. I think that the big problem with me today was I'm also agreeing with a social democratic prime minister for once. That's the, <laughs> that's the situation today. That, uh, that's it. So, but uh, history is a good, uh, it's probably the best way to, to learn from history. And I was uh, to just before the shutdown, I was in, in Berlin and visited uh, the Normannenstrasse, uh, the, ex, uh, the secret police museum. And when you see how they used, how hard they had to, to spy on their citizens, how many people they had to use to, to, to 
to learn almost the smallest bit of information and everything like that is so easy to collect today and people give that away freely and because of ease of use it's complicated to 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 regulate your own uh, integrity and privacy but i think the only way is actually to learn from history that there is a threat to giving away too much information uh, about yourself and i hope that people a lot of people i think that's that's perhaps our one of our most important tasks for the future to or that's a task we have to work with all the time to to get people to read uh, about this and perhaps visit places like the Stasi museum and so on and learn about about the history and how it can uh, come back again if we don't learn enough thank you anders uh, thank you Luca, for very dad, much uh, no, it's uh, we you know, Sweden is not so advanced as you say. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Um, thank you so much, Anders. Thank you so much, Luca, for all your thank valid you. uh, comments. Uh, to thank you, Georgina, for you know, waking up so early and bringing so, so, so much sun, sunshine <laughs> from the, the other side of the ocean. Thanks to the, uh, the entire audience that followed us. The event is being recorded in terms of privacy, so all the data will be out of uh, out there. Please help sharing this video, help sharing this conversation that served to, you know, uh, uh, educate people on the other side to open a debate. That's why I had fun by saying we need to disagree because if we agree too much, something <laughs> is definitely not, uh, not working. Thank you so much. We see each other in the coming weeks. Uh, last question that was asked directly to me about the painting. Since we are gonna talk about intellectual property very soon, I'm not gonna disclose anything about the painting. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everybody. We meet Thank very you. soon. Thank you.